Behold, my glorious supporter Pingers has requested some damage type design space. Let me explain. So Pingers says, part of my response to their previous parlay about embiggening, uh, as a brief aside, basically the idea that in a lot of like RPG games, attacks will go, you know, this is a fire attack and it's fire, fire, fireaga, fireagalia. You know, the name just gets bigger and the attack just gets bigger, which can be a little underwhelming, uh, that concept. Um, so at, because of my response to that parlay, uh, Pingers got thinking about the ways that games will thematically link things together to try to sell the idea of a type of effect as a kind of mechanical philosophy or a build craft path, as well as being whatever it is in the fiction. Let's give an example if you're confused. For example, maybe a game themes fire magic as impulsive and unpredictable, and the mechanics back that up. The damage numbers are fairly high, the cast times are quick, they affect a lot of targets, etc. A few examples of my own. Maybe they crit, maybe the damage range is kind of random, maybe the fire lingers and could be positive or negative beneficial. Um, anyway. Uh, Pinger says, I think this type of theming is often what something like embiggening is primarily in service of. Uh, the idea is to sort of theme that set of fire spells around them all doing this thing, but then of course they've got to get better, so some of them just do it more, you know. Probably the most consistent category Pingers has seen this kind of theming apply to is damage types. I agree, which I think makes sense to give some kind of conceptual clothing to hang on to, otherwise abstract numbers are just appended to abilities and it doesn't feel like that damage type. Pinger says, your task, Andy, should you choose to accept it for $9, which I did, is to describe how you would theme an arbitrary set of damage types so that they have a unique identity in a game. You can decide what kinds of mechanics may or may not apply, statuses, cooldowns, reactions, go crazy or not if you want, with the caveat being that I've chosen the damage types you'll be trying to create a coherent theme around. Yes, I've chosen them by picking random objects around my room. Your game's damage system contains lamp damage, fork damage, bottle damage, and wire damage. Good luck and have fun. So the question is revealed. Basically, we're going to talk about the idea of creating different mechanical hooks to, you know, how is lamp damage meaningfully different from wire damage beyond something really simple like certain enemies are weak to lamp damage and others are weak to wire damage. You know, that's boring. Something a little more than that, right? I mean, that's fine, but I don't, I think it's boring. Um, and we, we have four arbitrary damage types that are not normally what would be damage, right? Um, so let's let's talk about that. Um, now it's tempting, of course, to look at these damage types and say, well, okay, some of them are maybe transformable into familiar damage types. And I think that we probably shouldn't do that. I feel like it makes the question less interesting and fun it makes it easy or too easy. Um, but briefly, I'll explain what I mean. Lamp damage could be like heat or fire damage or light damage uh, because it produces those things. Wire damage could be electrical damage. Fork damage could be like earth or rock or steel type Pokemon, which has always been weird to me. Um, and bottle damage could be slashing or glass or like a more physical, you know. You could do that. Fork could be piercing. Um, but I'm going to try to just give them their own things that are more unique to those objects. Um, but also talk about, you know, like objectively what design space maybe is there. Um, so let's start with wire damage. I think there's kind of three approaches to, to get going. You could look at all the types and think about, well, what would make them not overlap as much? So wires are fairly different from lamps, forks, and bottles. They're not as solid. They're generally very bendy. I guess forks are kind of bendy, but you know. Um, and they they do carry a type of energy already, usually, electricity. So you could have them do things like that. Um, you could have them be like vines, kind of a utility element. Uh, it wraps enemies up and makes them slower, or it could trip them, or it's technical maybe, which kind of fits and interprets the electricity theme without making it just be electricity. You go, Bleh, and wires come out of your hand and you fire Emperor Palpatine electrical bolts out of your hand. Like, no, come on. I mean, sure, but that should be a minor thing, I think. It's more fun if we carve out more design space. 
I think that for this example, we should assume that the game only contains lamp, fork, bottle, and wire damage. And if more damage types are going to come along, we simply won't bite off way more than we can chew. Uh, we'll give them some solid fitting constraints or, or design principles and not go too far so that you could add an element to the game and yet you know the design space makes sense with only these four elements so wire damage is going to be my utility one it's going to be one where maybe you can whip enemies for some some uh, other kind of damage like slashy damage or something um Let's not worry about that for now, but you can maybe you've got some reach. Uh, it can be maybe more subtle. You know, a wire could creep through the environment. Traps with wires uh, is kind of an obvious one, I think. Tangling things up. Yeah, and then electrocuting them. I feel like the electrocution, though, should be you kind of have to grapple the enemy. So this is one for the chess player. You know, you lay down your wire traps, maybe whip them from a distance. Uh, for some control to poke away at them not too much damage maybe it's not that great against armor or something unless you grab them um, but then if they get caught in your wire attacks or if you you whip them at close range or something that's when you get to hold them and restrain their movement and also zap them maybe piercing armor or conducting with metal or something um, so more of a, a combo or preparation themed damage type uh, with, with effects like that. Uh, maybe these are all on pretty short cooldowns, but you kind of have to place the traps physically. Um, so this one isn't as defined by ranking out a bunch of different attacks. It's more about picking which ones you want to use, making cooldowns a less meaningful restriction for this one. It also seems really combo-y with the other ones. Like, whatever they do, holding an enemy still or zone controlling them, this will probably be an element or a damage type that people playing whatever this game is will splash a little bit more. It's not going to be one of the ones for the people who want the big bongo damage numbers, although it might be good with them if those attacks are like slow or whatever. One important part of designing damage types, I think, is to think about who they appeal to to make the game prevent the game from being needlessly narrow, to include things for a variety of people and make those things do a variety of things. Even if the wire damage is like, or, you know, the, the thinking man's player of this game, maybe the player with the big bongo damage attacks would desire to keep enemies still more and then they'd get excited that there's a tool for that. So sure, that, that sounds nice. We'll leave wire damage at that and move on. Lamp damage. Let's go back to that. Yeah, I think like damage in an area, zone control, but like damaging, not, not because it grapples or controls or trips people, but you go in the area and you take damage from the radiant heat of the, the OP lamp uh, in that area. Maybe the lamps are kind of defensive. I like the idea that the lamp is kind of tanky. The lamp shade, lamps have a lot of gear on them sometimes well compared to a fork a bottle and a wire anyway um wires could be defensive in that you know they have the the plastic or non-conductive rubber or whatever coating over them but well, let's not worry about that for now maybe wire damage helps you defend yourself against wire damage because the electricity and i don't know let's come back to that um lamp damage is going to be yeah you know, like heat uh, maybe things that stay in the area for too long burst into flame. This is going to be your damage over time one. It's for me anyway. Um, primarily damage over time. Doing really no damage up front and maybe sort of ramping as things heat up too much. Maybe lamp damage could have an overheat mechanic itself. Uh, so while you want enemies to stay near it and keep it on or whatever, you don't want to do that too long, and there could be this interesting gameplay, especially if this game is PvP, where being near a, a, a something emitting lamp damage uh, would have be a game of chicken. You're taking increasing amounts of damage, but you know that the lamp thing will eventually overheat, so maybe you try to wait it out or like bait them into overheating it, and then they have no tools for a second, you go. Um, again... Not one where I feel like cooldowns make that much sense. I feel like this is where overheating, a sort of heat gauge for your lamp abilities. You don't want to put out too many at once. That maybe balances it a little bit. Um, and defining different types of damage or different types of attacks by being restricted in different ways is, I think, a really, really interesting hook for a game that I think is underused. I don't see a lot of games. I can think of a few games that do that. 
But it's fun to say there are cooldowns in this game, but not for everything. And then the player gets excited by no cooldowns. Whoa, but you do have to be careful, you know? Uh, that That's interesting. That, that encourages people to try to use something they're not immediately drawn to. Uh, they don't want to not do upfront damage, but they're frustrated by the cooldowns on the upfront damage uh, that for fork damage is probably going to do. Uh, I don't know. And so they think, oh, well, I'm interested in no cooldowns. Maybe I'll give this a chance, even though it didn't immediately appeal to me, because there's a carrot, no cooldowns on your attacks, that they want, and yet it's still balanced. That appeals to me a lot. The idea that wire damage is like, you kind of have to prepare things in a melee-ish range. So if you're not prepared, maybe that there aren't wires set up and you don't get as much of an effect. It's not as effective. You need some time to set up. You can zone enemies with your wire attacks, but it's not about you having like limited cooldowns or overheating or running out of resources. It's about like, you need to have a plan for how you're going to use the environment and defend yourself with your wires that you set up or something, or bait enemies in, you know. And lamp damage is going to be about not overheating, managing that heat. I also like the idea that lamp damage is about placement a little bit. Uh, this is ridiculous, but lamps are about where you place them in the environment. So it's kind of an interesting flavor thing to think of lamps as like totems. You plop down your lamp and there's a physical lamp and it emits the damage. And so you are kind of a zoning character as well. I'm going to have fork and bottle not involve any zone control, not any area control, not as many AoEs because lamp and wire damage are both kind of doing that already. So now we've got some design space to manage. We have a few things doing that, not exhaustively using area of effect attacks, but we could certainly do with a very single target focused one, forks maybe, um, and a quick one, one that is really snappy. I think bottles, let's do bottle next. So it's glass. Glass can break and then is just broken. I like that. I think there's something there. This is your stereotypical damage, burst damage character. You throw the bottle, you get some big bongo burst damage. These abilities have cooldowns. You don't get another bottle as quickly. I don't know, but it, but it fits thematically with it being a lot of burst damage. Um, and you might even have different choices for, you know, you break the bottle, which burns the cooldowns on your abilities to throw the bottle, but then you gain other abilities because it's a melee weapon. This would be adaptable, burst damage focused. You have to manage cooldowns. You do need to plan ahead because you don't want to commit to a certain type of bottle damage attack, smashing it versus throwing it uh, without being sure you want to fight at that range, ranged or melee or whatever. Uh, so you do have to think about that on the fly. This is your, you know, combo offensive glass cannon. Ha 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 ha. You know, uh, okay. Um, mage uh, that does big bongo damage, but then is really vulnerable if they don't do something to prepare. Glass does feel shieldy as well. Um, bottle damage could involve you put yourself in a bottle, you know, bottles can contain things. Um, the idea of sort of ice blocking yourself or awarding yourself with broken glass on the ground even, but then it hurts you if you walk through it as well. That's interesting, maybe. Not sure why you're immune to lamp damage, but not glass damage, but whatever. Anyway, uh, bottle damage is quickly becoming glass damage. But yeah, like bottle, um, having a, something in the bottle, like summoning water or some such. I don't know why. Maybe this one has healing. Something that's interested me in the past is how healing, you know, is weaker if you're not as tanky. So it's actually not that unfair to have a burst damage like glass cannon kind of character. That archetype, it's kind of okay for them to have healing because they cannot like they they could die in one or two hits. What are they going to do? Heal right in the middle and remove their only strength, their big burst damage? Healing is often simply unproductive on these characters unless they weave it in. Maybe bottle damage could involve some stuns as well uh, and that or zone control like the breaking the glass and spreading it around, but that's just short lived, you know, enemies just have to move slower or whatever um, inside the broken glass to avoid it like caltrops. And while they're doing that, you could maybe pop off a heal really quick, or you do so much damage in a big burst that the bottle damage player or bottle damage focus player has time to pop themselves a quick heal. That could be interesting. It also gives them flex potential to just be primarily a healer. And then if they top everyone off, they have something to do. They can burn their cooldowns and do big burst damage, right? Uh, that could be cool. 
So that's a thought. Uh, bottle damage is maybe your burst damage or your, your get your resources out really quick uh, on the spot. You don't have to set anything up. You just kind of go uh, and you've got your effect, but then it, you know, you've got cooldowns. And then we have fork damage. Now fork damage, the thing about fork damage, it's all about that single target. Uh, you get the puncture, you can maybe get through armor better. Uh, what, is your, what is your reward for being a single target focused attacker? You can pierce armor, uh, you maybe have really good sustained attacks, like you don't have to stop for some reason. There isn't any overheating or setting things up or the glass breaking thing that I was talking about with bottle damage. There isn't any of that stuff holding you back. So you've got great room to just keep attacking, which defines the archetype. Um, maybe some cooldown focused abilities, but just so you can't spam one kind of attack. It's not about having long, chunky cooldowns. It's just about managing the cooldowns you have, the shorter ones. And so now we've created a, a set of damage types that have kind of different appeals to different people and which restrict you in a way that is a different experience so you can pick which one you like but also which hopefully makes you see the merit of the other experience which i think is useful so what i mean is that if you play wire damage and you're excited to zap people and tangle them up but then you realize that it does require a lot of preparation and you just don't want that suddenly bottle damages you know smash and grab playstyle sounds really appealing to you but then you get kind of annoyed by the long cooldowns and you go to lamp damage because it overheats instead but you don't like not being able to attack consistently you like the steady damage but you don't like that you kind of have to like not do too much or whatever and you want fork damages marauding you know repeatedly stabbing the guy play style uh fork damage is probably also kind of a combo one uh, where you want to follow up with certain attacks and you have to choose what order to make things available in the cooldowns don't restrict you in that you always have attacks to do, but they restrict you in the sense that you can't just have it up all the time. So if you want to lead an attack into another different kind of fork stab that does some kind of, you you know, twist the fork around inside them and they bleed internally, this is the most violent game ever now, uh, you, you have to make sure that cooldown is available. You can't just mash them all, but you don't have to make a tight rotation necessarily. You just have to keep in mind, oh, I need to not mash this ability because I'm going to want to get it if I land this attack and then combo into it. Maybe fork damage is something like that. Um, lamp damage has that zone control, but is all about the overheating. If you don't like that, you could go wire damage. Again, they kind of have different appeals that hopefully, while being different experiences that some people will like, also kind of reflect each other. They're good foils for each other. They're not all designed with the same kind of restrictions, but they all just do different things as a reward for playing in those restrictions. The restrictions themselves are different and thus lead to seemingly overpowered in the context of other elements effects that are balanced by some unique restriction. I think that's cool. Um, it sounds fun to play a game that is balanced that way. I have played a few games that I feel like are balanced that way. Um, Chris Tales has some difficulties. There are some things about Chris Tales I don't like, uh, like random encounters can, can burn in a fire, but it does do this where each of the characters in your party is kind of itself their own game mechanic. Like some of them just don't use mana because they have an overeating mechanic or they're really focused on elemental weaknesses. And if you just find that boring, like I do, then you can just not use that character. And you, you know, characters have elemental weaknesses still, but you don't have a character whose value is focused on that thing. So if you're not interested in that, you could just get rid of it. You could just not use it. Um, you can combine elements you like to sort of make your own version of the game's mechanics, your own subset of the game's mechanics that you like. And if you don't like one, you can still combo a few things together without using, you just hate fork damage. So you can still do something cool with lamp and wire damage and be the zone control guy. Yet you, you know, you still have a robust gameplay experience with choices. And there's still something you didn't choose, bottle damage, that you might want or you might pick up an ability from. But you can still avoid something you dislike or you just think fork damage is boring, you know. This kind of game design is often termed as being a way to let the player pick a f one thing or a few things, a small number of things in a game that they're playing to say like, I would rather not, I don't want that. So just take that away, I'm not interested. Um, and then you get to 
you know, play with the things you want. You could just say, I'm not really interested in that that much. Um, Disco Elysium's design is kind of this way. You sort of build your character by picking different stats, like a, a role-playing game stereotypically, and then that determines basically which parts of the book that the game is you hear. The game is essentially asking you to edit the book on the fly for yourself by picking skills that bring up parts of the story that you actually care about basically um and i think the game does a good job with that in that the descriptions are thorough enough that if you read them you will probably pick parts of the book that you like and then you'll end up enjoying the book a lot a really interesting strategy that lets maybe more people enjoy your game by letting it adapt to the player playing it um, i think that's cool what do you think uh i i wanted to make sure that i i answered the question um I feel like this sounds like a fun set of mechanics, but I think the true test is what I said at the top of the video. Let's now add a fifth element, a fifth damage type to this game and see if it has space. Spoon damage is what it will be. Gla mm, no, not glass. That's bottle damage. Spoon damage. Um, this could be like fork damage, but like really hardcore tanky. Uh, you can shield yourself from things. You can block area of effect abilities from a direction, you know, by putting your spoon in front of them. You can lift and throw opponents. You can maneuver people about. Maybe this one is good for teamwork and positioning. You could fling enemies into your own lamp or wire area control effects. You could use a wire area control effect to hold an enemy so you can spoon them. Maybe this one is also really good for like really slow wind-up attacks and you just wabam them with the spoon is like a hammer, you know? I don't know. I don't know. Um, maybe you can even spoon away area of effect attacks from like lamp and wire damage or bottle damage. You could sweep up spoons don't really sweep, but whatever uh, the the glass or something. So you can clear effects from the environment, um, and it's it's got kind of that niche. This is kind of a counterplay or like the player that really pays attention to the opponent. That kind of play style, um, kind of another utility one because we didn't really make like wire damage is sort of the lone utility option but this is kind of like an aggressive utility choice uh kind of the the aggressive defender type you're tanky so you can get up in people's faces and kind of brawl a little bit and if they turtle you can whack them with your big bongo spoon hammer move i don't know why it's like anyway um there is some open design space let's add yet another one can we uh we'll add Pants damage. Yes, pants damage. Uh, what should it be? Um, pants damage could maybe ooh, adapt to a certain kind of damage. What does this do? It lets you power up a following attack. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, you buff yourself. Is that what it does? You put pants on. They're on top of something else. What is that like? What is the, what is the flavor there that we haven't already used as well? Yeah, like buffing something up or charging an attack in some way, um, using time to build up some larger hit. Um, this could be flavored itself with like movement. Ooh, it's fast. That's what it is. It's fast. That's why, because it's your legs. It's quick and you also charge stuff up. So it's all about like spacing and you get away from people and then you have time to charge something or you can close the distance really quick and your attacks are maybe like a little weak, but you can just get in little bits of damage. Um, not like Fork, where you have to you have this sustained solid damage output that pierces or whatever. You have unremarkable, but really, really quick, very safe damage. And you kind of have to wait for your moment and then charge up an attack to make it strong enough to be a meaningful hit uh, after barraging the opponent with these little harassing attacks. Uh, I like the idea of of a kicking focused character as well uh, that is more about just kind of slapping people with your feet uh, rather than these sort of uh, the fork is kind of the knight that is swashbuckling with a sword um, these kicks are more about just giving giving them the what for uh, and then you back off a little so you can see how the de the design space is narrowing in this theoretical game i made but there is room even though there were four that were like sort of in unique places you could add more for expansions or updates and have them still have their own space at least i think so um, which i think indicates that I did an okay job, uh, not biting off more, making them specific enough have their own identity, but also general enough 
that they don't feel unrelated to each other. They don't feel like they're in different games. Uh, you can imagine this is like a team deathmatch in a kind of urban setting. And so you have somewhat limited close quarters-ish fighting. This isn't about long range attacks. None of these do that. Um, even bottle damage, probably the spell sniper of the group, uh, doesn't necessarily do like super long range. Bottle damage might just have the equivalent of like a grenade or something, you know, um, a Molotov cocktail, if you will. Uh, so sure, maybe there are a few ranged attacks, but this is more of a melee focused game. It's it's feeling like uh, that's also a thing you could do. You could say, I want to develop these kinds of mechanics. What game does it make sense for those mechanics to be in? Uh, there are a lot of games that don't do this, and you can really tell there's a, a thing in the game that it's like, this is cool, but not in this game. You know, it doesn't belong here. Uh, games that just do everything can be guilty of this idea. Now, simultaneously, before we finish this topic, which I had a lot of fun with, I hope you can tell, I'd like to kind of put a little asterisk in for myself. What I just did works if you're kind of building the game from the ground up, but sometimes you know the game is going to like intend to go or the, the success state for the game is going to intend to be for like a few years. So it's not going to make sense to design only a few types and then you can add a few more but you're going to want to add like eight more damage types i would want to make wire lamp fork and bottle damage way more specific you know so that there's room looking forward for enough damage types and i'd want to think to myself you know but let's say i had to do like 20 damage types can i do that is there have i left myself enough room is there enough room and is there maybe a sort of wild card or x factor i could pull if we do eventually start running out of room so that our game being successful doesn't make our game worse you know um, many 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 games fail to answer that question if your game is successful how do you prevent it from making the game break you know uh, there are a lot of games that shall remain nameless that are guilty of this thing you need to make sure that the design system you made works in a limited form, but can be expanded without the game snapping in half like a twig. Um, I am very curious about some games that kind of have this in the air. Genshin Impact is a good example of a game where there are seven elements, and four of them are kind of a round robin of elemental reactions, pyro, cryo, hydro, and electro. And then two of them are more about reacting with the one of those four elements that's already there. Animo spreads those four elements, and Geo crystallizes and creates shields out of those four elements. And so Animo and Geo are a little bit more independent as elements go, but also have kind of a single general type of synergy with those four reacting elements. Okay, so that all makes sense. But then we have a, a seventh element in Genshin Impact that we know is coming but isn't player playable yet. Dendro, which is plant life. The other ones are probably pretty obvious. Animo is wind, Geo is earth. The other ones are the elements they sound like. Pyro is fire. Okay. But Dendro is plant life, and it's not really clear. Like, what would that do? What does it, what does it, what will it do? You know, <laughs> does it add a reaction to the other ones? Like, it's like Pyro, Cryo, Hydro, and Electro, but it just has its own unique effect with each of those four. And then Animo and Geo, like, make it be more of that effect or something, you know? Um, it, it's a little unclear to me. I'm really looking forward to seeing what they do. When, when Dendro is added to the game and we find out what design space they probably set aside ahead of time for that element. You know, my point is that it's a case where Genshin Impact it wasn't like made and they had six elements and then eventually they thought, oh, we should add a seventh one. That would be a really good update. Like, no, they knew from the start that there were going to be seven. So if they're remotely competent developers, which I think they are, they would have thought ahead of time at least a little about like, okay, well, what what is it? Like, what should it do? We should make sure we have room for it to do something that feels natural, doesn't feel awkward and separate from the other six, especially because the player will already have gotten used to the other six, you know? I'm very, very curious to see what happens in a situation like that, where we were made to expect and be wondering, of course we're going to wonder, what does it do? And then after like a year and a half or two years, probably a year and a half, uh, we get it and, oh, that's what it did. And we can see whether it feels natural. 
I think this is a, an important thing. There are a lot of games, like in Warframe, I think the elemental balancing is mostly pretty sensible, not not necessarily the status effects, but mostly pretty sensible, but void damage is just awkward. Like they kind of added a damage type and it doesn't really feel like it fits into the game. There wasn't really space open for another damage type, we just got one. There was a, there was a place that kind of wanted another damage type, but what it does doesn't feel like it fits with the rest of the game, I don't feel. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is that Warframe is a game where the elements we had to begin with were actually a pretty complete use of the game's design space, which is good because it felt good to use them, but also restrictive in that it's going to be very hard to add another element and not make it feel artificial. After all, Warframe's elements are kind of a jigsaw puzzle. They kind of fit together. Uh, the, some of the elements are combinations of the existing base elements. So you can't easily just add another one without it being something totally separate, because if you add a combined element, well, what's it made out of? And if you add a single element, well, what does it combine into? You know, And so it, the system kind of automatically makes it very hard to introduce yet another element. Um, this kind of design proofing, this sort of future proofing your design space, um, thinking about, you know, what are we going to do if we want to use this design space in the future, uh, is useful and, and valuable, and you can see how games benefit from it when it comes up. Uh, I think even it is the case that games benefit and it feels good when a game doesn't use all its design space, even if it could, even if there's like they know they're not going to update it. Uh, Hades is a good example of this. We have no reason to believe there will be Hades updates or DLC. They kind of said there wouldn't be. But there is some stuff you could easily add, you could imaginably add. There are gods that are obvious additions that are simply not in the game that they could add if you wanted to. Now, it's a little complicated because Hades does have this thing where, you know, there being eight gods, eight kind of core gods, and then Hermes and some other ones that don't count for those eight that are on rotation makes the game predictable in a very specific way if you play it a very specific way which we do when i stream it and that would be changed if you added a ninth god into the mix you see what i'm saying i'm not saying that's necessarily a problem i think there's just a range like you wouldn't want to add 10 more gods that would fundamentally change the game and make some game mechanics that made sense stop making sense i think but if you were to add just one more or if you were to remove one i don't think that that's inherently a problem in fact as you play through Hades, there is a period of time where one of the gods or goddesses is not present in the pool, and it doesn't cause any problems for the game, because it's more about the vague number that are there. All in all, I think there's a really interesting topic, like how are game systems designed to accommodate more or less options, infinite options, or essentially no more options? What do you gain by making that choice one way or the other? Uh, do you even care about the flexibility? Does it even matter for certain games? And then there are games where it obviously matters, and they either know that it matters or they don't know, and then they get burned. I think that's really interesting. So I loved this topic. Thank you for asking about it. And I see that there's a parlay related to it that I'll do right now.